Okay, court of contact questions, which I assume you remember the court of contact from the, uh, the parabola, and it does involve a bit of work to solve a court of contact question. We're going to do it the second way I showed you last year, which you may or may not remember, which felt like a bit of a, a, bit of a fudge, but it's a lot quicker. Okay. You've got an external point. So that external point is x naught, y naught. And that's all the information you know, remember. And you want to come up with the equation of the chord of contact, which is the, the chord that joins the two tangents. Because from any external point, you can draw in your two tangents. So let's draw those in. So there's one going through the point x1, y1. Now, we know we could derive that equation. It would end up being x1, x1, a squared plus y1, y1, b squared is equal to 1. And then we'd have another one, which we'll go through, we'll call q, uh, which we've called x2, y2. And it would have the equation x2, x on a squared plus y2, y on b squared is equal to 1. So we could derive either of those things. Now, we know the point t lies on both of those tangents. So therefore, it must satisfy both of those equations. So if I substitute x0, y0 into both of the equations, they must be true statements. So they now are both statements of fact. We know those things to be true. Okay. Now, therefore, P and Q must lie on a line with an equation like so. And there's your chord of contact. Now, it feels like a fudge, I know. But remember, an equation of line, what do we know? It has to be a constant times x plus a constant times y uh, plus some number is equal to zero if we have it in general form. Well, remember, we've subbed into the blue one and come up with x1, x0, a squared, and y1, y0, and b squared is equal to 1. Now, remember, x0 and y0 are constant numbers. It's our fixed point that we drew from. So, and x1, y1 is the point I'm substituting into this equation. So I have got a constant x0 on a squared times x plus a constant y0 on b squared times y. And then, okay, it's on the other side equals some constant number. Then when I have a look at what we said is a true statement for the green line, again, x0 on a squared is a constant. So I've got a constant times the x value I've substituted in plus a constant times the y value of I've substituted in is equal to, to 1. And that constant is the same in both. It was x0 on a squared and y0 on b squared. Therefore, that's going to be the, the equation of the line. Okay. Voila. And the other thing you'll notice about it, again, it mimics the actual equation of the ellipse. So the equation of the tangent, the equation of the chord of contact, the equation of the actual ellipse, they're all very similar type of equations. So that's got to be the line PQ. So there is our chord of contact. And that is the quickest way of finding the chord of contact. Rather than, and if you remember how we did it originally with the parabola, first of all, we found the equation of the tangents. Then we found the points of intersection and said, oh, but we know that's x0 and y0. That got us some relationship. Then we found the general equation of the chord PQ. And we tried to replace the parameters with x0 and y0. And there was a lot of work to do doing it that way. So this is a much quicker way. Uh, the core of contact, we've done a very similar way with the hyperbola. And you would end up, and again, it would look like the equation of the hyperbola. x0, x on a squared minus y0, y on b squared is equal to 1. All right, well, let's have a look at our rectangular hyperbola x, y equals c squared. Now, this is the way we originally did it with parametrics. We found the equation of the chord. So in this case, cp, c on p is one point. cq, c on q is another point. We could show the equation of that chord as x plus pqy is equal to the constant times p plus q. Then t is the point of intersection of the two tangents. So we could solve them simultaneously and we would come up with this expression. 2CPQ on P plus Q, 2C on P plus Q. So therefore, X0 is 2CPQ on P plus Q, Y0 is 2C 
on p plus q. So what we basically want to do is substitute in and get rid of the pq and the p plus q from the equation of the uh, chord and replace them with y noughts and x noughts. So if I substitute in, okay, we're rearranging it, uh, I get x plus p plus q x naught on 2cy is equal to cp plus q. I've still got p plus q's in there, but I can get rid of p plus q because using the y naught, I can say p plus q is, let's get it the right way around, it would end up being 2c over y naught, wouldn't it? Because y naught is equal to 2c on p plus q. So substituting that in for p plus q, and we've got rid of the p's and q's. And we've got the equation, looks messy, but we have got the equation of a chord in terms of the external point, x naught, y naught. So that was the technique we used with the uh, parabola, the first method, which, as I say, a lot more working out doing it that way. Uh, we tend to rewrite it, get rid of the fractions, and so there it is. It got a little bit more pattern to it, I suppose. And again, if you look at it very closely, it does have the format of the actual equation, because the actual equation, remember, is xy is equal to c squared. So we've got an xy sort of plus an xy sort of, so we end up with 2c squared. So it still has that sort of feel to it. All right, let's have a look at some geometric properties of conics. Okay. So the first one, quarter contact from a point on the directrix will be a focal chord. Uh, so we'll look at the ellipse. Now, T, that external point, is on the directrix. Okay. So therefore, instead of calling it X naught, Y naught, I could call it A on E, Y naught. Now, the quarter contact then will have the equation. Remember the equation we said was x, x naught on a squared. Well, now it's x times ae on a squared, which tidying it up, we just get x over ae. But we want to show it's a focal chord. Well, easiest way of doing that is substituting in the focus and into the left-hand side, and hopefully it'll equal 1. So if we sub in ae naughts, sure enough, I end up with 1. So yes, that particular line does go through the focus, so it must be a focal chord. Okay. Here's an interesting one. That part of the tangent between the point of contact and the directrix subtends a right angle at the corresponding focus. I think we're going to need a diagram to explain exactly what we're talking about here. So let's draw it up. There's our ellipse, put in the directrix. There's our tangent. I've used the parametric coordinates this time. A cos theta, B sine theta. So that part of the tangent between the point of contact, which is P, and the directrix, I've called that point T. So PT is that part of the tangent. Uh, subtends. Well, remember from circle geometry, subtend means get two points, join it up to a third point, you'll create or subtend an angle. And so what we're saying is PST should be 90 degrees at the corresponding focus. Remember, each directrix has a corresponding focus. So we're talking about the one closest to it. Okay, let's prove it. We want to prove that angle PST is 90 degrees. Uh, we know the equation of the tangent, or we can find it anyway. So, let's find the coordinates for T. We know that's when X is A on E. Sub that in, and making Y the subject. A little bit of work to do there. I've ended up with this expression, B outside of E minus cos theta, all over E sine theta. Okay, so there's T. So if I want to prove it's a right angle, the easiest way, I guess, is playing with the slopes. Let's see what happens. Slope of PS, B sine theta minus 0 over A cos theta minus AE. I get B sine theta over A cos theta minus E. Might leave that one there for now. Slope TS then. Uh, fractions on fractions, yuck. So let's multiply, or invert and, and multiply. Uh, so, making the bottom one all one fraction and turning it upside down, I've got E on A minus 
AE squared, so there's a more factorising that'll happen there as well. So what have I ended up with? A, 1 minus E squared sine theta, B, E minus cos theta. A, 1 minus E squared, that's very familiar. It's not quite right though, is it? We had something that would look like that. What was it? A, 1 minus E squared, we had... Yeah, but we have the A squared, not just A. So that's not quite B squared on the bottom. What would that be? Is it? B squared over A. Yeah, because then that would create the A squared there that we need. So did I bother to do it? Oh, well, I've made it a little bit more obvious by actually making it A squared, 1 minus A squared there, over A. And so the B over A, but then we... I've turned the A to the top of the fraction, and so eventually I've got AE. Well, have a look at my two slopes now. And you can see it's going to work out quite nicely. So let's multiply those together, and sure enough, everything's cancelling there, but I've got a negative factor here, cos theta minus E, E minus cos theta, and I get that the two lines do multiply together to give negative 1. So we have proven what we want to prove. So angle PST is, in fact... 90 degrees. The reflection property. Okay, we had a reflection property with our parabola, you remember? We have one for the other conics as well, so let's look at the ellipse one. Tangent to an ellipse at point P is equally inclined to the focal chords. Let's draw a picture. So there's our ellipse. This time I've drawn in both directrices. And there's our tangent. So meeting at T and T dash, drawn in both foci and join P up to both of the different foci. Okay, so we're saying a point P is equally inclined. So what we're saying is angle TPS should be the same as angle T dash PS. That's what we want to prove, they're equally inclined. All right, I'm going to construct a third parallel line uh, going through P, but also parallel to the y-axis. Well, I suppose technically it's a fourth parallel line as well because you've got the y-axis as well. Now, drawing a horizontal through P because remember the idea of sometimes it's easier to work with horizontals than it is with working at lines at an angle. And we have got that relationship that I can use uh, that the focal length is equal to the eccentricity times the distance to the uh, directrix. So I can replace PS. Well, what have we got here? I've said PT over PT dash. So PT over PT dash will be the same as PN over PN dash. Well, that's just uh, our property of the transversals with parallel lines. We know that any transversal will be cut in the same ratio. Rearranging that, I've got PT over PN is equal to PT dash over PN dash. Okay. Now, this is where I'm going to use my relationship with PS and PS dash, what I was talking about. The definition, basically, of a conic. Distance to the focus is equal to eccentricity times distance to the directrix. So if I sub both of those in for PN and PN dash, I end up with this horrible looking thing, fractions on fractions, but as they're both over E, the E's will, will cancel. So I just have PT over PS is equal to PT dash over PS dash. We just proved that that part of the tangent between the point of contact and the directrix subtends a right angle at the focus. So PST must be 90 degrees, but also applying it to the other focus and directrix, PS dash T dash must also be 90 degrees. So they are both right angled triangles. Have a look closely then at those right angled triangles. PT over PS would be the secant of angle SPT. Mm -hmm. No, just trigonometry. Remember, we've just said that is a right angle triangle. So in that right angle triangle, hypotenuse 
over adjacent. Okay, so we know it's And then the other one, PT, PT dash over PS dash is also hypotenuse over adjacent. So that would be the secant of the other angle. But they've both got to be acute angles because they're both inside right angle triangles. So they've got to be the same angle there. So angle SPT is equal to angle S dash PT dash. And that is what we we're trying to prove. Okay, now this one here, there were questions back when we did complex numbers in the, uh, the locus part, which were asterisks, and said, oh, you may want to wait later on until we've looked at conics. Well, we've now looked at conics. So this sort of question where we see modulus plus modulus is equal to a constant number. Okay, and we use it, this fact. Remember we proved it at the end of the last set of theory, some of the focal lengths is equal to a constant. We said PS plus PS dash, and it was equal to 2A, if you remember. Okay. Well, that's what I'm saying here. I've got Z joined up to a point, negative 2, and I've also joined it up to a point, positive 2, and I'm saying those two lengths, no matter where we put Z, is always going to be 8. It's always going to be a constant. So this must be an ellipse. And what we're talking about here, these two vectors would create the two focal lengths, or focal chords, more correctly. So if it's equal to 2a, because we know that relationship, I know a in this particular ellipse then is 4. ae must be 2, because we're joining z up to the focus. So I now know the eccentricity is a half. Well, we also know b squared is equal to a squared 1 minus e squared. So from that, I get b squared is 12. I know a squared. I know b squared. The only other thing I need to work out is where is the center of this ellipse? Well, it must be the midpoint of the two foci. So if I've got 2 and minus 2, it is centered at the origin. So it's x squared on 16 plus y squared on 12 is equal to 1. So the nice little questions, you might want to go back to uh, that exercise in Patel, those couple that were asterisks, to have a go at those. So I think, they, I think I've listed them, there they are. So it's 4N, 1LM and N.